Hello and welcome to the debate. I'm Kavit Tafli. North Korea warning of possible strikes on U.S. bases. Are these empty threats or is there an imminent war on the horizon? Maybe a nuclear one? The U.S. and South Korea have taken these threats seriously, while many analysts seem to think a war will not happen. And the U.S. decision to send its nuclear-capable B-2 stealth bombers is increasing the risk of a large-scale war in the already unstable Korean Peninsula. In this edition of the debate, we'll be asking our analysts whether there will be a war or is North Korea flexing its muscles to coerce South Korea into softening its policies and to win aid from Washington. There is increasing war rhetoric on the Korean peninsula. Every day brings more warnings and flexing of muscles. North Koreans, who are agitated by external provocation in the region, are on high alert. Thousands have turned out for a mass demonstration in support of their leader's call to arms. Reports have said that North Korean leader Kim Jong-un has ordered army rocket units to be on standby in case of provocation from the U.S. or South Korea. Kim says it's time to settle accounts with the U.S. The time has come to settle accounts with the U.S. imperialists in view of the prevailing situation. The U.S. hostility against North Korea has entered a reckless phase, going beyond the phase of threat and blackmail. Pyongyang is insisting it's serious. We will demonstrate with practical military action the firm will of the army and the people of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea to take concentration to defend the sovereignty and dignity of the supreme leadership of the country. But South Korea is playing down its northern neighbor's show of force. Seoul has said it's nothing more than psychological pressure. The latest joint military drills by the U.S. and South Korea are making the North speak in sharp tones. During the war games, the U.S. Army ran practice sorties of two nuclear-capable B-2 stealth bombers. The U.S. Forces Command in South Korea has said the bombers flew from a U.S. airbase in Missouri and dropped dummy munitions on the South Korean island range on Thursday. Uh, no, I don't think we're doing anything uh, extraordinary or provocative or, or... But analysts regard the use of B-2 bombers capable of carrying nuclear warheads as a threat by the U.S. against North Korea. They're telling the North Koreans, uh, we can attack you in ways in which you can see us coming, and we can also attack you potentially in ways in which you cannot see us coming. At the same time, North Korea has said it can destroy any stealth bombers or submarines that violate its sovereignty. We will do away with the B-52 strategic bomber and nuclear submarine which the enemies think are great as soon as they move. Ordinary residents of South Korea are afraid of the consequences of heightened tensions. This elderly Seoul resident says she is so afraid that South Korea could be targeted as well. Pyongyang has cut the last military hotline with its southern neighbor, a sign of complete readiness to take action. With continued U.S. provocations and North Korea's rockets pointed at the U.S. mainland and regional American bases, it remains to be seen how the situation will unfold in the coming days and weeks. Let me introduce our guest for this edition of the debate. From the Asia desk, the Executive Intelligence Review, Mike Billington, joins us from Washington. And we have a Congressional Defense Policy Advisor, Frederick Peterson, who also joins us from Washington. Gentlemen, welcome. Mike Billington, basic question, is there going to be a war? If so, what will it look like? And what would trigger a war? Well, it, it's very, very possible that there'll be a war, a thermonuclear war, but not with Korea. What's going on in this Korean thing is uh, basically fraudulent. Uh, similar to what's going on with Iran. Uh, put this in the world context. We're in the midst of the total breakdown of the Western financial system. Uh, as we saw with the breakdown in Cyprus, which is not a Cypriot problem, it's not even a Europe problem, it's a Western financial system problem. We're, we're looking at the death of the euro. The United States itself is bankrupt and printing money at rates unprecedented in history to bail out bankrupt banks while our physical economy in Europe and the U.S. is crumbling. And it's under that impetus that uh, Wall Street and the city of London uh, are using their puppet in the White House uh, to lead an open provocation against Russia and against China 
demanding that they back down from the new <coughs> colonial policy of regime change at will under the kind of dictatorship we have under Obama now, who ignores the Congress, ignores, ignores the Constitution, and implements war at will. Uh, this is a demand upon him by the financial uh, oligarchs, and the intent is to justify setting up offensive military structures, both around Russia and China, as we are with both the ABM <coughs> systems and other offensive weapons, which the Russians and the Chinese have publicly and repeatedly identified as a very serious threat, a, a potential counterforce threat, which could take out their retaliatory capacity to a first strike and which therefore has moved the world closer to a global thermonuclear holocaust than we've been ever in history, including the Cuba Missile Crisis and similar situations. Uh, the uh, idea that these massive capacities are being put in place to deal with Iran, which has no weapon and which our own American intelligence sources confirm over and over again are not building a weapon, or against Korea, which has a small nuclear capacity but which is not insane, uh, and may issue a provocation in response to the repeated provocations back and forth between the U.S. and North Korea. But it would be small scale of the sort that you saw before the shelling of an island. The idea that they would launch a nuclear attack is, of course, ludicrous, uh, technically as well as politically. The danger is that this is being played, as you see in the headlines all over the world, even though our own chief of staff, General Dempsey, who has a far more solid thinking than the fool in the White House, uh, said just yesterday that he's seen no movement in North Korea uh, any different from the normal kinds of movements and statements that you see during these periods of exercise and provocations. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, the use of these B-2 bombers dropping mock bombs over South Korea is taken very, very seriously by the North. But the idea that they would, in fact, provoke a nuclear war with themselves is, is ludicrous, but it forces us to reflect on the insane policies coming out of London and Washington leading towards what could very well be, uh, could very, very likely be a near-term nuclear war with the major superpowers, one which would uh, literally destroy civilization, for which there'd be no winner. Well, I I'd like to expand on this because that's really the key question the general public and uh, as a whole is asking Frederick Peterson, and this, uh, the use of nuclear-capable B-2 stealth bombers is said to be a game changer in some senses, but some are saying it's not that the U.S. would uh, use the nuclear capacity of it, but rather use what's called this uh, 30,000 super bunker buster bomb uh, to destroy North Korea's uh, uh, underground military tunnels. Do you think that the U.S. has those kind of plans? Was the use of this B-2 stealth bombers a game changer, you think, at least in North Korea's eyes? I think the use of the stealth bomber <clears throat> is being grossly over, uh, overplayed. Uh, the stealth bomber uh, took part not as a provocation, but as a reaction to provocation by North Korea. By a 28 or 29-year-old, the, uh, uh, the reporting uh, varies on the age of uh, the uh, tubby dictator there, but his threats against the south of his own uh, peninsula and against the United States have been repeated, have been absolutely, utterly irresponsible, and to take no response to that would be a provocation. Uh, flying 2B2 bombers simply to demonstrate the capability and the global reach of the United States without threatening, uh, without any statements of uh, uh, predatory uh, intent whatsoever on the part of the United States uh, as part of ongoing military exercises, uh, self-defense exercises that are conducted every year uh, with the United States and its strong allies, South Korea, has nothing to do with uh, predation upon the North, mm -hmm. but rather they are defensive. Uh, the uh, uh, threat to settle accounts, quote unquote, that has emanated from North Korea and to abrogate the 1953, that 60 years ago, the armistice between the two, 
on the strength of virtually nothing uh, but a distraction from the poverty and gulag that he has established and imposed upon his own people uh, is, is, is beyond irresponsible. It is simply not the act of a, of a civilized or even a sane uh, world leader. Uh, in response, I, I should say that uh, uh, Mike's analysis of some of the economic uh, uh, positions uh, that the West uh, in general has uh, and is undergoing right now, uh, while I agree with the, a lot of his factual analysis, the conclusions, that the United States is somehow a threat to world peace and we have a looming global thermonuclear war uh, emanating from the West is a wild uh, conclusion uh, that simply does not add up from the facts uh, on which uh, we concur. Uh, I would say that um, that's a bit irrelevant from the discussion uh, that we were having from uh, uh, on, on North Korea and its uh, current emanations of, of threat to the rest of the world. Uh, I think that plans appearing on uh, state television there with a map demonstrating the plan, the quote unquote war plan to attack four U.S. cities uh, Washington, where we're sitting right now, being one. Uh, Los Angeles, uh, Austin, Texas, where incidentally South Korea has major uh, business concerns. Uh, and the island of Hawaii and also Guam was thrown into the mix. Uh, to think that that somehow is not provocative and deserves no response to me is, um, uh, I, it's quite obvious that it does and the response was quite moderate uh, and appropriate on the part of the United States. Uh, for whatever uh, positions I may and Mike may uh, depart from uh, commonality with this administration and with many of the economic policies of the West, this certainly is not one of them. Thank you. Well, Mike Millington, one thing that doesn't add up, uh, and that's something that you said, uh, which uh, the U.S. has done and perhaps more increasingly because of this, is the buildup, whether it's through military equipment, personnel, uh, as a result of this. And uh, why didn't China, in that respect then, react quicker when uh, these military exercises were going on, except later on coming down and uh, obviously saying the sanctions are okay? Oh, the military exercises well, China are, are normal has, military uh, exercises. A, there's, I'm sorry, Mike there's Billington. There's some provocation. But Go ahead, Mike Billington. Yes. The, well, look, I mean, the, let, let's be serious here. Um, what, what Fred said about the response, the seriousness of global thermonuclear war is not the way it's viewed by uh, Mr. Putin or Mr. Medvedev, who have stated repeatedly that the threat of a counterforce strike, as is being constructed in Europe and in Asia, uh, with the new anti-missile systems, the X-band radar systems that they're putting in in Japan and and, and the Philippines, which in no way are n necessary against the very small threat from Korea. Not that there shouldn't be actions against that, and not that the North Koreans don't do provocations. They're notorious. But if you look at what not only the Russians and the Chinese have said repeatedly, warning, as Medvedev said, we are potentially on the brink of thermonuclear war. He said, I don't want to scare you, but he said thermonuclear war. Uh, and in our own situation, the situation within the United States is highly factionalized. What's standing between us and war at this point is the Chinese and uh, Russian refusal to capitulate to the re regime change policies across the Middle East after making the mistake of capitulating in Libya. They will not in Syria or Iran. And the West may not want a nuclear war, but they want Russia and China to capitulate to their regime change policies. And if they don't, they're willing to risk that Fine. war. Fine. Let's and get a response. Me, a sorry, Mike Billington. The other thing response. standing let me get a between us and war is. Let me get a I'm sorry, Mike Billington. A response well, let from me Federal finish my statement. I'll be right done. I'll be right done. Go ahead. I'll, I'll be right done. General Dempsey is the other person who's standing in the way of this threat. In fact, he's on his way to Russia, and he intends to deal with 
the kind of provocations coming from the British and the United States towards Russia. Go Frederick ahead. Pe Frederick Peterson, your response to Mike Billington there. Yes. Uh, Mike, uh, we're beginning to develop a wider gulf between our perceptions here to somehow post up Putin as a font of reasonability and liberal, uh, shall we say, credibility in the world is, is it, I mean, it, it, it borders on the absurd. Uh, Putin, former head of the KGB, who has been, if anything, a great saber rattler and agent provocateur, both throughout the Middle East and throughout the world, uh, uh, looking at them as being, uh, they and China, as somehow standing in the way of global thermonuclear war, I think as it was said, is, I, I mean, I don't quite know how to respond to that because uh, uh, it really has utterly no basis in factual or uh, uh, really any military or security uh, realities uh, uh, on either side of the equation. So. Okay, let's take a quick time out and listen to some of the let viewer me, comments. Um, let me respond by... to continue? Okay, before we do that, Mike, uh, Mike Billington, go ahead. Your response before we turn to the viewer comments. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I would say two things. One is that I think you should look at what Donald Gregg, the former CIA official and ambassador to Korea, had to say last week when he returned from Korea. Uh, he said, and he has said in the past, if you look at the world from North Korea's view and you see that those nations in the Middle East who have, in fact, given up their nuclear weapons programs, uh, like Iraq, like Libya, uh, have been destroyed by this vicious, uh, ugly regime change, mass murder policy, turning these nations literally over to al-Qaeda-linked terrorist uh, ethnic groups, uh, threatening to do the same in Syria, threatening to do the same against Iran. Uh, this is viewed by most of the world as insane. Uh, and they say that North Korea, seeing this, is absolutely unwilling to accept the current status, or this current demand by the West, that they will only talk with North Korea if North Korea first gives up its nuclear weapons. They see what's happened in the rest of the world, the nations that do that. They want a nuclear deterrent. But Donald Gregg, I think, quite interestingly said that what the North Koreans do want right now, and the reason they disbanded the armistice, is that they're tired of living in the no peace, no war, basically an official state of war since the Korean War, and they want to talk about establishing a peace treaty. If the West were willing to talk to them and stop the tit-for-tat provocations and talk seriously about trying to reduce tensions in Asia rather than in increase them, uh, then they'd be willing to talk. Mr. Lavrov's response, the foreign minister in Russia today, to this situation was that provocations are coming from both sides, that the measures taken at the United Nations, which both Russia and China agreed to, to warn North Korea to hold back on its nuclear tests and its mm -hmm. missile tests, uh, was adequate, he said. But the expansion of military operations around North Korea, which happens to also be around China, is threatening a escalation, what he said, slipping into chaos. This okay. is real. Anybody who tries to deny that these kinds of policies between the United States and Russia and China are brinking towards war is literally in a, in a fantasy state. And it's very, well. very important that the world recognize very well. that we Peterson, have to look before, seriously at this crisis as a danger to civilization. Frederick Peterson, before I get a yeah, response ahead, from sorry. you, let's uh, take this time out quickly to uh, take a listen to what our viewer comments Said, uh, have said on our Facebook page. I'm absolutely sure that any slight mistake will lead to a major war which the whole world will regret. Okay, that was one of our viewer comments. Uh, Frederick Peterson, your reaction to that, but more importantly, what Mike Billington also said. Okay, I, I would just say that uh, we talk abstractly about provocations uh, from the United States and from uh, South Korea on the north, and that to me, and then in the same breath we talk about fantasy. I think the two quite well go together. That is an utter fantasy. 
these military defensive exercises have been going on for 60 years. They are entirely defensive. There have been zero, is exactly zero, threats that have been made on the North, from the South, or from the United States in 60 years, except insurance of the integrity of South, Viet uh, South Korea and the integrity of the United States. On the contrary, we're talking about provocations. I have not seen President Obama coming on television with a target map of North Korea talking about incinerating cities with nuclear weapons. That, on the other hand, has been done by North Korea with massive marches of uh, uh, military might and citizen demonstrations. I'm sure they were well paid to be there because that's about the only job that they could get in North Korea at this time. Uh, and, you know, you'd be willing to show up for a couple of potatoes and a bowl of rice given the current uh, famine conditions there. Uh, and yet, instead of concentrating on becoming a peaceful partner in the world and cooperating and collaborating with their neighbors, both China and South Korea, and the United States as well. Instead, we find mm -hmm. North Korea once again bantering its military might and mouth in order to attract attention. And we find uh, Russia, God bless them, uh, and China also turning the magic wand and manipulating uh, opinion to stir up trouble against that hated United States that uh, represents values that admittedly are quite contrary to those that exist in Russia and in China right now, and uh, right. values that they would incidentally do well to emulate. Mike Billington, a response to Frederick Peterson there. Well, I, I think it's, it, we should step beyond that tit-for-tat argument. We're, we're in the 30th anniversary of the announcement of the Strategic Defense Initiative by President Reagan, in which he proposed a policy uh, uh, actually uh, uh, organized by Mr. Lyndon LaRouche, my boss, uh, who convinced Reagan to go with that. The idea was to work together with the Russians on building space-based uh, advanced technologies, laser beam and particle beam technologies that could stop nuclear missiles and end the threat of war. Uh, Th that was sabotaged within the U.S. and by the Russians who rejected it under Gorbachev and Andropov. Uh, but the Russians now are proposing to the United States that we work together on dealing not only with reviving the SDI approach to war, but also to use those technologies to guard against the threat of, as of asteroids and comets which could threaten whole sections of the, of the world or even the whole human race. And yet, we're getting no response. Obama continues to take down our NASA program, continues to massively cut our military capacities, uh, and threatens war rather than actually building up the kind of global collaborative efforts needed to deal with the actual threats to civilization, those of a potential nuclear war between the superpowers, and those of, our, of the asteroids which we saw in, over Russia just recently, which could in fact threaten civilization. That's human. That's using our minds to collaborate on a global basis to deal with the problems facing mankind instead of being drawn into these regional secular wars, regime change policies, and in the midst of the greatest financial blowout uh, in the history of mankind, which is threatening to destroy not only nations, but in fact the entire world economy and the world civilization. That's sane. We need to launch Glass-Steagall policies to deal with, the, with, with the, uh, the bankrupt banking system, and we need to launch global collaboration on advanced technologies, strategic defense of Earth, as it's called by the Russians, uh, to do what, in fact, we should have done back in 1983 when Reagan wanted to, and end this kind of uh, Cold War mentality and get down to work to do what mankind better do if we're going to survive. Wish we could continue this conversation. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Thank you very much, Asia Desk Executive Intelligence Review Mike Billington there from Washington, and uh, Congressional Defense Policy Advisor Frederick Peterson, also from Washington. Thank you for your statements, and thank you for watching another edition of the debate. Any questions or comments, newsroom at pressv.ir is our email address. From we cover Taiwan and the entire team in the capital, Taiwan, it's goodbye.
Well, joining us now to discuss this further from New York is the founder of StopImperialism.com, Eric Dreitzer via Skype. Many thanks for joining us here on Press TV, Mr. Dreitzer. Now, an estimated uh, $6 trillion in the long run for this war. This is while well, the American government says it doesn't have money for unemployment benefits, for health insurance benefits and claims. Where are the priorities of the American government? Well, we should remember that the American government is really the representative of an imperialist ruling class. When we say the American government, we're not really talking about an entity that represents the people. As we all know here in the United States, we have a rigged political game. We have two political parties, each of which represents the interests of finance, capital, and the military industrial complex. So uh, I think that the question of priorities is, is somewhat um, unnecessary. The priorities of the U.S. government are to wage war and to exert hegemony all over the world, particularly in the Middle East in this historical period, but certainly not limited to that. And I would also just uh, say that the that the study is really in many ways misleading. It's true that these wars have cost American taxpayers this amount of money, but don't forget that an equally incredible sum of money has been made by defense contractors and by those in the military industrial complex who profit from wars. So although uh, myself and other Americans are paying uh, through our taxes to fund these wars. Dick Cheney and uh, and Halliburton and all of these types of entities, they're making out with billions. So really, it's not simply the, the amount of money that taxpayers have spent on the wars. We should also consider the amount of money that has been made by those forces profiting off of death of innocent people around the world. All right, speaking of which, as you mentioned, it's the American taxpayer that ends up funding these wars for the profit of uh, major corporations and the American uh, military industrial complex. So speaking of which, how much of this do you think the average American taxpayer understands and even knows, considering it is their money that is being used not for the benefit of the citizen, but for imperialist agendas? Well, the American people are thoroughly propagandized. That is to say, many of them live in a state of perpetual fear, a fear that is stoked by uh, news outlets, news media, and popular culture. Uh, Americans also live under tremendous pressure. The vast majority of this country is struggling just to survive, to put food on the table, and to take care of their families. So when we consider the, 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 the mindset of American people, you have to remember that most people are not engaged with these type of issues. For for most Americans, uh, the war in Afghanistan, the war in Iraq, these are simply news items. These are more dead brown people that they don't have to think about. But of course, as we see uh, with the economic situation in this country, all of these things are now coming to bear on the American people, and they're beginning to have to engage with these questions. But we should not underestimate the difficulty of uh, unwinding this vast propaganda matrix that has been used to essentially break brainwash the American public. The fact that we were able to maintain seven simultaneous wars at the moment, killing countless innocent people, and there is not a mention of it in the mainstream media, not a mention of it in much of the so-called alternative media, that tells you all that you need to know about the mentality of the United States. And very quickly, if you can, what of those American taxpayers who are aware of how their money is being spent and do not agree with it? They don't want their tax, pay, tax money to go to funding imperialist agendas towards killing of innocent civilians in countries abroad. That would be a, a, a small percentage, I think, of the of the United States. There are many who are certainly against Iraq and Afghanistan because they can put a face to those wars, the face of George Bush and Dick Cheney, two of the most reviled political figures in, in, in recent history. But now that we are in this age of Obama, the imperialism has become a little bit less overt, uh, uh, not quite so out in the open. And it's, be, and it's for that reason, I think, that many Americans, particularly Particularly those so-called liberals uh, have a very hard time connecting the imperialism that they know is existing and is continuing and is perpetuated with the political establishment in the United States. And it's for that reason that people like myself are tremendously fearful for the future of our country as we watch ourselves going down the path of perpetual war and genocide once again. Okay, that we're going to have to leave it there. The founder of StopImperialism.com, Eric Dreitzer there 
Joining us via Skype from New York, Mr. Dreitzer, thank you very much for your comments thank here on you. Press TV. Jeff Steinberg joins us from the Executive Intelligence Review from Leesburg to uh, give us his thoughts on this. Jeff Steinberg, if we were to take uh, U.S.'s stance on this in terms of the threats coming from the north, are we looking at a showdown to occur? Uh, there's a very real danger of that, and I think that the primary problem is coming from the U.S. side. Um, I, I think it's well known to any serious analyst of North Korea that um, the North Koreans make these kinds of bellicose statements and sometimes even uh, military provocations to get attention because they want to move beyond this armistice situation uh, where the Korean War technically is still only at a truce point and is not ended. And they want some kind of recognition and, and relations. And if you look at the history in the Middle East of the countries that were accused of going for or having nuclear weapons but never really intended to and never got them, uh, they were subjected to uh, completely illegal regime change military action. So uh, I think the measures taken by the North Koreans, uh, as bizarre as they may seem, are defensive. And the primary problem is that we take these things seriously and refuse to actually sit down and negotiate a serious and binding full treaty agreement and normalization. We could end this whole game, but the danger is that you could escalate into a confrontation that does get out of control. Uh, as you said in the news account, um, you know, North Korea uh, at most has the capability of producing one or two nuclear weapons with no delivery system other than sticking it in a truck and driving it to the DNC. The United States could wipe North Korea off the face of the earth just with the Ohio-class submarines and uh, B-2 bombers and B-52 bombers that are already pre-positioned with nuclear warheads in the region. The question is whether or not the United States, as a, quote, superpower, wants to escalate this thing to world war that could be nuclear, or whether sensible diplomacy is going to prevail. The ball's not in the North Korean court, it's in the U.S. court. Are you surprised, at least as far as I can tell, the lack of uh, reports, uh, to say the least, of China and uh, perhaps U.S. pressure on China in terms of what is going on? The Chinese would like this thing settled. And, you know, in, in the mindset of empire, which is what's dominant in the Anglo-American section of the West, the assumption is that North Korea is a colony of China and that the Chinese can just simply snap their fingers and the North Koreans will do what they're told. That's not the way these things work. Uh, these are sovereign countries, proud countries, and they know that they are facing regime change threats from much bigger combinations of powers. You've got air-sea battle, which is posing a direct threat to China. And the point is that the bullying games really don't work. They never work. And under the present circumstances, they could bring us to a larger war. So the Chinese and the Russians just completed a whole series of military joint agreements, defense agreements, at the just concluded summit meeting in Moscow and then the BRICS meeting in Durban, South Africa. So uh, I think that People are looking to avoid provocations, and the provocations are coming from the West. I think those in Iran who follow the whole situation closely are painfully aware of this. Sanctions and threats of war are not going to lead to peace. They never have and they never will. Thank you very much for that. Jeff Steinberg from the Executive Intelligence Review. Good to talk to you.